talk about quantum classifiers, the implementation of quantum support vector machines, and if there's time, I would walk you through a demo. So this is a recap of quantum of support vector machines. We discussed support vector machines in class, and a summary of the main uh, attributes of a support vector machine is that you are using uh, an algorithm to find the best hyperplane that separates two data sets or one class from another. That hyperplane is supposed to be the one that has the maximum margin between these two classes. And the points that define these margins are known as the support vectors. So the, in the end, the support, vector, the support vector machine is supposed to maximize the margin between, these, uh, between the support vectors and the, the hyperplane. Now, what we did in class, we usually considered linearly separable cases. So in such a case, for instance, in this scenario, you realize that there are a number of, or there are a number of uh, ways you can separate this data set. We define that as having an infinite uh, hyperplane uh, situation. But then what the support vector machine does is that it finds the best one that is able to maximize this margin. So it's classified as, it's also known as a maximum margin classifier. The problem with support vector machines come in when you have non-linearly separable cases. So on the left, you realize that you have a linear data set, but then you have two classes. If you want to separate this, you need at least two lines, one over here and then one over here. But then the way the support vector machine works by default is using just one linear classifier. The same happens in this situation. You will not be able to use a support vector machine to separate this uh, data set using just one line. Now, what's the solution to that? And to handle situations like that, we use kernels. A kernel is simply a transformation of the data using a feature map from one dimension into another dimension. And using such kernels, you'd be able to transform the data such that you'd still be able to use a support vector machine to separate the two classes using a linear classifier. So this is an example of you translating a linear problem into a polynomial of uh, using a polynomial kernel with degree two. So with that, you'd be able to separate these two classes with this. And over here, we have this expression here. Now you've translated it into a three-dimensional version where you can use a hyperplane to separate the two classes. So before we proceed to the quantum variation, I would want to give you a brief overview of how a quantum circuit looks like. So you have some initial states that are usually uh, set to zero. So you have the ket zero, and then you have gates, which are a set of operations that will be acting on your initial gates. And then finally, at the end, you have measurements that would return the probabilities of you observing uh, particular states at the end. So how will we proceed with uh, classification on a quantum computer? The first step would be to translate your data points, your classical data points, into the quantum analog. And you'd use a uh, circuit for that. So this would be our unitary circuit. It takes in the, the qubits initialized at uh, ket zero, and then it would apply an operation on it. This file that you are seeing here could be any classical function that you apply on your data set prior to translating it into the quantum computer. The next step would be to define a parameterized quantum circuit with parameter theta. This theta would be something that you can train, such as the, in a similar way that we train the weight for a neural network. And then finally, we apply a measurement that it would return a classical value, so negative one on one for the two classes that we are interested in. When you combine all these three steps together, we have a template or an answer that is generally known as a quantum variational circuit. So that's what is usually used in uh, basic quantum classifiers. So for SVMs, what we are going to do is follow the same uh, procedure above, but then we are going to go into detail. So the first step would be to define our feature map. This is the map that is going to move our uh, classical data into the quantum variation. And that is defined by this expression over here. Our first term is a unitary operator, and that is just a, an expression for a set of operations that will be performed on the quantum computer. And that is followed by a Hadamard gate. So the Hadamard gate will put all the initial cats that we initialize to zero into a superposition so that the quantum computer can take advantage of that. We would run this feature map or this circuit twice. So that would mean that we would have a depth of two. And that just means that we are repeating this expression twice. So finally, at the end, our feature map would have this expression. Now, once we translate our data into the quantum variation uh, or the quantum analog using the feature map, we'll be able to represent it on the block sphere. The block sphere is just what we use to represent qubits uh, on the Hilbert space. So the position of a qubit on this block sphere would indicate the value. 
Now, once you are able to do this translation, we are able to calculate the normal vector to this uh, data set. And that would form the hyperplane that would be used to classify the data points. So for instance, if you look at the diagram, uh, the, yeah, the diagram to the right, you'd have the two classes. So anything that is above the hyperplane, you'd have, we'll put it in a positive class. Anything below the hyperplane, you put it in a negative class. Now, the main advantage of the quantum support vector machine would be the fact that it is able to make use of kernels, kernels that would be able to capture more information than the ones that are used in classical machines, or in, at least that's what we hope in theory. Now, what the kernel does is it computes a similarity score between any two data points using something akin to an inner product. But since we've translated them to a quantum uh, circuit, the expression for the two uh, classical data points will be given by this expression. So the main goal or the key point is that if you choose a feature map that a classical computer cannot simulate, then you translating it to a quantum computer, you might be able to get some advantage in using a quantum computer. However, there is no empirical proof that that has happened yet. So after we've computed our kernel, the next thing is to measure the kernel, measure the output. And this is done by measuring the overlap between the two states. As I mentioned earlier, the kernel behaves like uh, or the operation is similar to compute the inner product. So if you have two states that are the same, the inner product will be one. And if the two states are different, the inner product will be zero. So it's kind of like a chronical, uh, it's kind of like having a chronical delta. So that's using that, you'll be able to simplify most of the operations that are happening in the quantum circuit. And at the end, any state that is not zero and is one, you'll be able to tell that those states belong to the same class. Anything that is a zero means they don't belong to the same class. So I would pause here and then walk you through an implementation in Qiskit. Yeah, I'm coming. Okay. So what we have here is IBM's quantum lab, and I'll be using Cascade, which is their quantum computing library in Python. To demonstrate how the quantum support vector machine will work, I'll be using the breast cancer data set. After importing a number of things, uh, the main uh, elements in the data set is that you have two classes, either benign cancer cells or malignant cancer cells. Benign ones are ones that are not harmful. And malignant ones are the ones that can be harmful to you. So let's just skip. Okay. So this is an initial plot of the two classes in the data. If we are supposed to use our eye to try and classify it, you can see that a simple line along this direction might be enough to tell the two classes apart, obviously with some misclassification in both cases. But that is something that we would expect. Now, this is how the classification would look like if we are using our traditional support vector machine. So after training, we had an accuracy of 90% on the test set. So we have this hyperplane separating these two classes. Let's see how the implementation would look like when we move to the quantum version. Okay. So here I used a different uh, polynomial, sorry, a Gaussian kernel and the accuracy was still 90%. So there's no difference between using a linear and then the Gaussian kernel for this particular problem. Now, when we come to the application in case kits, what we are, we are going to follow the same procedures that I defined earlier. So first you have to define our feature map, which is going to take our classical data points and then bring them into the quantum analog. And then conveniently, they've written up a wrapper function for the implementation of the entire quantum support vector machine. So you pass in your feature map, the training input, and then the test and then it will compute that, and then we can save that output. From there, we'll pass that into a simulator. So IBM has a number of simulators that you can use to test your code. Once you run, uh, you run, uh, you write code in Qiskit, that would simulate a quantum circuit. So you can pass it to the simulators and then they will return the outputs. Once you are convinced of the outputs, you can actually send it to an actual quantum computer at IBM. So here we just use this to define the environment for the simulator that we'll be having. The shot here would represent the number of iterations or the number of times we'll be running our code. Because the output of the quantum circuit are probabilities, ideally, we want to take advantage of the law of large numbers. So the more times you repeat the measurement, ideally, the better the, better the accuracy of your measurements. 
So that's what this is. And these are just seeds that we use to make the whole uh, analysis reproducible. So after running that, we save the results over here. And then from there, we can now use our model to predict on the test set by passing the whole thing into the same quantum instance or the environment that we created. And we are able to generate this plot. So from what we have over here, the uh, classifier is saying the points in yellow are on one side and then the points in, is it purple, are in another. If you compare that to the actual test set, we realize that our classifier misclassified only this point up here. And that's uh, at the end, what we have over here is that we have an accuracy of 95%. So in this situation, our classifier was able to do better than the classical version of the quantum support vector machine. So that's the little I have for this presentation. And these are some of the references. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. That was a very nice presentation. Um, any questions? Please unmute yourself if you have any questions. Okay, no questions. Thank you again, Nate. So we can move on to the next presenter.